The F-22 went from the brink of being decommissioned to an over $9 billion worth upgrade program in just three years' time. I think that the least we can do is trying to understand why. Are we finally covering the F-22? Sir? Uh, no, Otis, because fully covering the F-22 would require several videos like we did with other combat aircraft. Moreover, the F-22 is well known to the general public and another relatively shallow coverage is not really needed. In this video, we focus on how the aircraft went from being considered expendable to becoming a treasure national asset for the United States. And by the end of this video, you will learn why. So this is very uh, American. In the second half of the 2010s, the US Air Force was in a hard place. The F-35 had allegedly reached the initial operating capability, but it was clear to every impartial observer that it wasn't true. There were plenty of issues not yet fixed, and the program development costs kept piling up. The aircraft was simply introduced into service too early. Since the Air Force and the Marines had put all the eggs in one basket and it was too late to take a deep breath and remodulate the program, they needed to run ahead and they also needed the funding to do so. So the Air Force came up with this idea of divesting for investing. In fact, the running costs of an aircraft are the largest portion of the overall lifetime costs. So having fewer aircraft to maintain, fewer pilots to drive them, and fewer units to operate them is a big saving. And these savings could have been diverted to the F-35 program. Several aircraft were in the crosshair, A-10s above all, but also B-1s, and at the end, the F-22. And in fact, it took a while before getting to the F-22, because the fleet is relatively young if compared with other aircraft. And let's be honest, the aircraft is the forbidden dream of a fighter pilot, so reluctance to divest it is understandable. Nonetheless, in 2018, there was a proposal to mothball the entire F-22 fleet in 2019, to save about 30 billion in the following years. The proposal did not go through, but it remained hoovering over the aircraft in different forms during the following years. But why would you do so? Well, to invest into the F-35 and in the then still quite nebulous NGAD program. I believe that this is very American, where the solution to every problem always is more technology. Not that I'm saying that it is necessarily wrong, but it is an American national trait. The discussion dragged on, creating a sort of a cognitive dissonance because upgrade programs had been approved for the F-22, while divestment plans were also flaunted. So we got to 2023 when a more balanced approach finally emerged. The overall F-22 fleet is now composed of 183 aircraft. Of these, the Air Force wants to divest 32 Block 20 aircraft, which are currently used for training and testing purposes, and launch a further upgrade for the remaining Block 30 and 35 aircraft. The difference in systems and weapons from Block 20 to Block 30 today, after all the upgrades in the last decade, is massive, and pilots moving from 20 to 30 need to unlearn some of the things they learned in the older variant. Moreover, in the words of the Air Force Deputy Chief of Staff for Plans and Programs, the Block 20 aircraft are inferior to the J-20, whereby not being operationally viable. You have to understand that, despite being often considered the apex predator in the fighter jets food chain, the design of the F-22 is old school. The systems were designed in the mid-90s, and the progress of technology in the last two decades has brought radical changes. The various upgrade programs have somehow mitigated the issue, the aircraft has reached a reasonable standard, but even a contemporary Block 3035 is not considered superior to more modern 5th generation aircraft like the Su-57 or the J-20! What's this place? What is? You should stop trolling your audience, sir. What is? Where are we? This is the Moronax, a sub-dimensional parallel space, 
The meltdown you caused in some of your viewers generated a singularity which ejected us from the regular space-time. But is there a way to go back? Sir, my logic board is based on Valvaxon technology. I have a decorrelationship that can deconvolute the singularity and collapse us back to the regular space-time. Uh, what are you waiting for? Do it! I need a paper uh, tissue uh, to power the chip, uh, sir. It is an energy-intensive process. Like this? Uh, sorry, I, I actually used it. Oh! Geez, Otis. That was in thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Otis. I would avoid controversial statements from now on, sir. Uh, well, I guess some people don't really have sense of humor. But they have a big metaphorical stick, sir. I recommend caution. Now I need recharging, sir. Yeah, recharging. The original F-22 design focused on a limited set of priorities because its original mission was air superiority and nothing else. And basically there were three of them. Number one, it had to be kinematically outstanding in terms of acceleration, speed and operating altitude. In this way it could hurl air-to-air -air weapons at a very long range and with high energy, since the weapon started its flight at a high altitude and high speed. Moreover, a missile launched at supersonic speed will not go through the steep rise of aerodynamic drag that occurs at transonic speeds, and in so doing it will use its fuel much more efficiently. We covered this in several videos on the channel already. The F-22 had to be capable of supercruising, that is, flying above Mach 1 without using the afterburner. And the F-22 was probably the first aircraft capable of an operationally useful supercruise, estimated to be between Mach 1.5 and 1.7. In this way, the aircraft is capable of staying in a high energy condition for longer, since the afterburner burns several times more fuel than the dry thrust. But it also had to be kinematically outstanding at close quarters if it happened to be involved in a knife fight. For this reason the aircraft features two-dimensional thrust vectoring and very large aerodynamic surfaces with great authority. The proportionally large wing surface leads to a, relatively speaking, low wing loading, uh, which also means high turn rates. The aircraft has been seen keeping a steady horizontal flight trimmed while maintaining an angle of attack of about 60 degrees. It has also been seen performing various postal maneuvers, which always look good at air shoves, or they can save your neck when you don't have a high off-bore sight short-range missiles, like the Block 20 aircraft, for example. Number two, the aircraft also features sensor fusion in one of the most sophisticated implementations at the time. What the pilot craves the most is situational awareness, that is, knowing what is going on around the aircraft. It may seem strange, but a pilot in a cockpit, even if it has a radar and some electronic support measures, may not be really aware of the battlefield picture, in what we call a four-generation aircraft, where each sensor gives its own autonomous presentation uh, of what it sees it is up to the pilot to combine these pictures in a mental representation of the battle. This is stressing, it requires a lot of experience, and in the heat of the combat it is distracting. Moreover, the most dangerous enemy is the one you don't see. The purpose of sensor fusion is to present a single integrated picture similar to the God's eye view that is shown in video games. In the case of the F-22, at the beginning it focused mostly on the AN-APG-77 radar and the electronic warfare suite AN-ALR-94, both modern and advanced systems. But this is not everything, the F-22 features a dedicated discrete and high-speed data link to share the sensor data among a flight of aircraft. So the sensor being fused may be located uh, in someone else's aircraft. Even without really knowing the details, it is intuitive that the airspace picture that can be built from such a large dataset is much, much better than anything that could be built on an aircraft without sensor fusion. Finally, the third priority, and I personally believe the less important of the three, was stealth. It was immediately clear from the aircraft external configuration that it was 
built to avoid the reflected radar waves back to the source. This is called geometric stealth and it is the reason why many modern aircraft designs all look superficially similar. Features like the chine, the absence of vertical surfaces or the platform alignment are typical of geometric stealth. The other feature providing stealth are the radar absorbing materials and the F-22 is covered in a radar absorbing cladding. Obviously the details are super secret, but these materials contain small metallic parts, spherules, but also very thin plates, whiskers, rings, loops, and so on. The radar radiation bounces around and it is reflected through the non-metallic material and it loses energy, coming out very weak and has a diffuse emission. The size of the metallic components determines the frequency where the radar absorption is most effective. RAMs are actually tuned for specific frequencies. On most fighter jets, the absorption is focused on the X-band, which is used by most fighter jet and fire control radars. From the rumors reported by other pilots who operated against the F-22, the F-22 cladding is very effective, at least in the X-band. The compromise, though, is that the F-22 ram is notoriously delicate and it degrades quite easily. It is not uncommon to see F-22s flying with cracks on the ram material while waiting for a repair. These original capabilities have been augmented over time. The aircraft was designed to be upgradable, but again, the design was old school. In fact, the aircraft was missing some features that are essential for the fifth generation, like side-looking radars, the infrared search and track, or a distributed aperture system. Some of these were axed in the development, some others were not considered essential at the time. There are several features that make an aircraft upgradable. First, the structural design must be such that adding something like a new fuselage section or enlarging the aerodynamic surface doesn't require extensive redesign. This is where transport and civilian designs shine, but also flankers are particularly well designed from this point of view. Consequently, the aerodynamic design should be such to tolerate changes of the center of lift and the center of gravity without requiring too many modifications to balance the aircraft. Considering the wing cord and the size of the aerodynamic surfaces, this should not be a problem for the Raptor. And connected with this, all the piping and the cabling should be designed to be moved around without too many issues. Please notice that the piping configuration, particularly for fuel, in an aircraft is not that trivial, since the perceived force is not always downwards. And when it comes to the aircraft electronic systems, it seems trivial again, but there need to be enough room to add black boxes. Modern fighters tend to be very packed because they are bored with many electronic systems. Miniaturization helps, but the size and weight of electronics tends to increase during the aircraft lifetime. And always remember that the aircraft must be kept balanced and capable of maneuvering. For example, adding a lighter or a heavier radar, uh, because it is in the nose so far from the center of gravity, is not just a matter of integrating the electronics, it may also raise balancing and inertia issues. Then all these electronics require power, which is produced by the engine, and the power reserve must be enough to power all the new electronics. Again, miniaturization helps, but the aircraft is not a smartphone. There are antennas that need to have a specific size, optical components, power electronics and analog components, like in the radar. Uh, the cabling must be of an adequate section and isolation and so on. And finally, there is software. So much, so much of the aircraft performance and effectiveness today depends on software. The architecture of software in combat aircraft has not developed at the same speed as the civilian applications. There are intrinsic problems connected with the design, the certification, but also the software needs to run on several different computers in an orchestrated way. It must interface with weapons and other add-ons, and there are not many standards around. It is a complex environment where errors may be fatal. In the last decades, open architectures have started to be adopted, but still updating software is a complex endeavor. Moreover, the updated software may require new hardware to run properly, starting a sort of a development spiral. 
The F22, we will see in a minute, has adopted a pretty clever solution to manage software updates. There are aircraft like the F35 that despite adopting a modular design since the beginning, they keep running into issue every time a major upgrade is required. I suspect that the issues are more related to the program management than to the technology itself, but still, uh, well, other aircraft, like the Gripen, for example, never have major issues. But, well, well, no, it actually had a big one many, many years ago, but that was it. The F-22 started with more than a million of code lines written in ADA and a pretty traditional monolithic architecture. This changed in the early 20s when the central processor was upgraded to commercial off-the-shelf units and orchestration via Kubernetes, which is another commercial platform, was introduced. As usual, the details are secret, but there is no doubt that from now on, software upgrades are going to be much easier. Other than the upgrades already mentioned, there have been several changes during the relatively short career of the F-22. At the beginning, there were issues with the oxygen system, later resolved, but, well, this is not really an upgrade, it is more a bug fix. The first significant upgrade was to give the aircraft some basic air-to-ground capabilities. It was designed as an air superiority fighter, so in the original design, pretty much no consideration was given to air to ground. The aircraft was integrated with the JDAMS and the APG-77 radar was modified, adding air to ground modes. In 2011, an important upgrade happened on the 143 Block 3035 aircraft. Synthetic aperture radar capabilities were added, always for the air-to-ground role. Now the aircraft could make very detailed ground maps to target its weapons. Also, the small diameter bomb was integrated. The electronic warfare suite direction finding performance was improved to the point it could be used for passive targeting. Unconfirmed rumors say that the error is no more than 2 degrees for a single aircraft, which is going to be reduced with two or more aircraft cooperating. The radar was improved to be used as an effector for electronic attack, in addition to the existing electronic warfare suite. In 2013, more electronic warfare upgrades were added, but most importantly, the aircraft received the basic integration for the AIM-9X and the AMRAAM-D variant. And, well, believe it or not, it received the Link-16. The Link-16 is the standard data link for NATO. It is a bit old, but it is the common language spoken by all NATO assets. Problem is, it is omnidirectional, and it doesn't fit well with stealth. So it was omitted at the beginning to avoid compromising stealth. Well, during this update, finally the F-22 got a receive-only Link-16 system. So it couldn't transmit, just receive. In 2016, an AG CAS was installed, the native data link was improved, with the radar now capable of working as a directional communication antenna. In 2019 came the full integration with AIM-9X and AIM-120D. In 2021 came another update that brought the aircraft where you expect a real fifth-generation aircraft to be. Communications were overhauled, a mid JTRS terminal was installed, in so doing adding the full capabilities of of the modern Link 16 implementation with all the available enhancements. It finally received a Mod 5 IFF, making the identification much safer. And finally, the aircraft could use the button as a gateway for communications with other aircraft. And in case you don't know what Mod 5 IFF is, what are the MITS GTRS and the Bakken, I'm not explaining now because the video is already very long and we have to cover in detail the latest, more exciting upgrade but we will make videos about it. Okay, change my mind, I explain it now. IFF stands for Identification Friend or Foe. I'm sure you heard this before. It is a system that sends an interrogation to a target and it interprets the answer to identify if it is a friend, a foe or neutral. Obviously, the identification is positive only if the target replies with the correct code that identifies it as a friend. You will never get an answer saying, I am a foe. So, a wrong or lacking reply always need to be integrated with other ID systems. 
However, the same systems are used to broadcast other types of information by the military, but also by civilian aircraft. And in fact, a military aircraft must be capable of identifying a civilian aircraft before shooting at it. There are international standards that are managed by ICAO and NATO with the Stanag 4193. Russians and Chinese have their own military standards, but conform to the international standard for the civilian aviation. Many Russian aircraft do not have the international standard transponders, but tankers, uh, transports, uh, AWACS uh, actually have it. The IFF mark identifies the hardware being used, the frequencies being used, and the waveforms. And the current standard is Mark 12 and it is used in military and civilian applications. The IFF mode identifies the information transmitted and the format used for the transmission. A Mark 12 transponder is usually compatible with various modes. Mode 1 and 2 are the simplest and they provide mission and unit code in the reply. Mode 3 returns a code that is assigned by the air traffic control, usually called the squawk number. This is used by civilian aircraft too, and it can also return the aircraft altitude. Mode 4 is a military mode, and it requires an encrypted challenge to elicit a reply. And it uses delays to avoid triangulation by an enemy. Mode 5 is encrypted, and it is the most complete, being capable of distributing information about the altitude, speed, and position of the aircraft. It is also the safest because an aircraft can issue a special challenge to the target before firing, and the transponder, even if if it is in standby, it will reply, don't shoot. And by the way, this is a very short summary of a complex and fascinating subject, and I invite you to dig into this. MITS JTRS is a mouthful. It is the hardware and software component of the Link 16 compliant radio. So the Link 16 is a line of sight data link working in UHF band with a range of about 300 kilometers. It has frequency agility to make jamming difficult on a range of about 53 frequencies. It is a pretty old protocol based on messages exchanged between the terminals containing data about the aircraft, its position, speed, altitude, and fuel situation. During the years, several improvements have been applied with enhanced messages containing additional information, voice communication, the capability to relay the information from a terminal to another, uh, navigation aids, and others. The JTRS is the most recent standard, which is actually based on a compatible software-defined radio. The importance of adopting this system on the F-22 is that the aircraft can now share the situational awareness of its own sensors and the other F-22s in the area with all the other Link-16 enabled terminals, providing high-quality tracks to the other aircraft operating within range. BACN stands for the Battlefield Airborne Communication Node. This is one of the most important and yet unknown to many aircraft in the US inventory. It is a Bombardier built business jet called the E 11 by the Air Force, where the BACN payload has been installed. The payload is capable of communicating with data links and radios used from various services and translates one into another automatically. For example, F-22 and F-35 used to have incompatible data links, but through the BACN they can operate as if they were on the same network. It is a fascinating capability that fixes the old problem of incompatibility among different technologies and different services. The E-11 has been chosen as a platform for its long flight endurance, but the BACN payload can be installed on other platforms. It has been installed on drones, for example, and there are actually plans to do so. So, after this long journey, finally, what is this update currently in the making? An update that should bring the F-22 to the forefront of the fifth generation technology? Well, first thing, let's see what is not included. In 2021, photos appeared in the press of an F-22 with a strange mirror-like cladding. F-117 have been seen before, and F-35s have been spotted afterwards. Nobody really knows what this cladding is. Most analysts agree that it is a form of infrared signature reducing coating. It could be, but it could also be the fabled broadband ceramic radar absorbing material that was announced a few years ago before disappearing into the world of black projects. 
I don't know what this is, but this is not part of the upcoming Raptor upgrade, according to the information that is in the public domain. And then there is the helmet. The F-22 is the only fifth generation fighter that doesn't have a helmet mounted display. It was cut from the original project to save costs and it was never implemented. In 2013, the Air Force tried to integrate the Scorpion helmet, which is already in use with uh, the Air Force itself, but the project did not proceed. Depending on who you ask, it was either because the integration was unsuccessful or because the helmet was not good enough for the F-22. Anyway, it seems that this subject is not going to be picked up again in the near future. Uh, sorry, this is the editing gas. It's not entirely correct that this is not going to be picked up again. In fact, there is an experimentation ongoing to determine what could be the best solution, but it's not a proper program to adopt one. I guess we'll see. Now, speaking of what is included, the Air Force has changed its policy to have small iterative upgrades. Thereby, it is unlikely that we will see one big upgrade with all the things we are going to discuss, as it used to happen in the good old times when aircraft variants had letters. So, there are several upgrades required by the Air Force and Everything we know about some of them is just a line in a document. One particularly interesting to me is cyber intrusion protection and detection, which prompts a question. Is the aircraft ever exposed either to a public network or to potential injection devices? The F-35, for example, is on a private and very well secured, but global network. So it has a larger attack surface. I have no idea if the F-22 may happen to be in the same situation. Another quite interesting point is predictive maintenance. Even in the civilian world, predictive maintenance has become increasingly common, so I'm not surprised at all that is included in the package. Which form is it going to take? We don't know yet. Because it requires a large amount of data from the aircraft, and as far as we know, the F-22 doesn't have yet the complex web of sensors that make it possible, unlike the F-35. If I'm right, this upgrade may have quite an important footprint on the aircraft, albeit I suspect that a simplified version is possible using the existing aircraft data. There is also an interesting training-related requirement, that is the simulation of red air, which means that in this mode the pilot will see on the cockpit screens a perfectly convincing air battle that exists only in the computers. Uh, it seems science fiction, but it is a relatively common feature on advanced trainers. The M346 Master has had it for 20 years now. In the documentation, I could find also some passing references to the synthetic data generation, which I have no idea what they are going to be used for in this context. I also found improvements to the radar, improvement to sensor fusion, improvements to navigation and timing, manned unmanned teaming, and assisted optionally manning, which means flying without a pilot, and it sounds like an oxymoron, despite being very, very cool. There's also a reference to real-time debriefing, and when I searched it, Google only returned links connected with surgery and medical events, so I guess it means that the pilot and the people on the ground can see a recording of what the aircraft has seen and what it has done in real-time without waiting for the aircraft to land and provide a hard disk with all the recordings. Let me know in the comments if you have a better idea. Now, thank you for getting this far into the video, and if you were expecting me to speak about the pods, the fuel tanks, and the AIM-260, now the time has finally come. The point is, everyone is talking about this, you find plenty of articles on the internet, and I prefer covering the stuff that nobody tells you, even though the others make a million views on the same subject. You are digressing, sir. Yes, Otis. Yes, I'm digressing. So, where is the AIM-260? The AIM-260 is the American representative of the current generation of long-range air-to-air weapons. The program started in 2017 in response to the introduction of the Chinese PL-15 and the Russian R-37. It was necessary because both these weapons are kinematically superior and outrange the AM-120 Amram, even the D variant. So far, we know almost nothing about the weapon itself. We know it is not air breathing like the Meteor, we know it is a single stage weapon, we know it has a multi mode seeker. 
but we never saw it. The first test started in April 2020. IUC was expected by early 2023, but it didn't happen. By now, we should have seen at least a picture of the missile on a fighter, but we have seen nothing. The F-22 has been earmarked as the first platform to use the weapon, so it can be larger than the aircraft weapon base. It is clear that the weapon is late at this point, which is normal for complex programs, but it is late nonetheless. So, let me speculate. Maybe, maybe the problem is that the weapon is not kinematically as capable as expected. Maybe the weapon needs the F-22 and its high-speed super cruise to outrange the Russian and Chinese counterparts. So the F-22 is an essential component of the whole package and you can't decommission the F-22, otherwise you will be left with a lame system. I don't know, it's just an hypothesis, just speculation. I suppose we will see. The F-22 doesn't have a very long combat radius. It was designed with European theater in mind where airfields are abundant and close to each other. The situation in the Western Pacific is exactly the opposite. There are few bases and they are scattered along the first and second island chain. Sure, the aircraft could make use of tankers, but there will be a great need of tankers in case of a conflict and these large aircraft are vulnerable, so they can't get very close to the targets. So something needs to be done to put the F-22 in conditions to operate in the Western Pacific with some flexibility. And the Air Force solution is, well, the traditional one, external drop tanks. In fact, the F-22 can already use 600 gallons fuel tanks, but these are just for transfer flights, because they completely cancel the aircraft's low observability. So, the Air Force is developing the LDTP system, the low drag tank and pylon. Despite the name, the real interesting feature is the attempt to make the tanks and pylons as stealthy as the aircraft. This is a pretty tall order because the pylons are a big no-no for stealth. They feature two terrible characteristics. The side is vertical in level flight and they form a 90 degree angle with the wing. Considering the geometry of the problem, it is safe to assume that the radar waves propagate horizontally when at a distance from the source. Vertical surface reflects them straight back at the source. Moreover, the 90 degree angle has the geometric property to reflect back the radiation exactly in the direction whence it came. So even when the pylon is not vertical because the aircraft is maneuvering, the intersection with the wing still reflects the radar radiation back at the emitter. Things are actually more complicated than this. There are other factors at play, like the radar frequency, skin propagation, and so on, but this is the core of the problem. Unfortunately, we don't have clear pictures of the system, only blurry images and artists' impressions. So we can only speculate about how they're going to pull this off. I believe that the pylons will be largely composite materials, transparent to the radar. The metallic parts inside the pylon will be hidden under heavy layers either of radar absorbing materials or under metallic surfaces inclined in a way to provide geometric stealth. The same will be true for the tanks. It is actually easier to shape the tanks and make them stealth, so they could actually be metallic and covered in ramps, but they could also follow the same idea of being made of composite with only the metallic sections covered by ram or being angled for stealth. The Air Force wants to acquire two full sets of LDTPs for each combat-coded aircraft. I am really curious to see how this is going to pan out. However, drop tanks are not the only thing that the F-22 is going to hang below the wing. Good pictures this time have emerged of a Raptor with two slim pods under the external hard points. As usual, we don't know exactly what's in there, but various analysts believe that there is an Erst, an infrared search and track, under the faceted edge. It would not be a very conventional installation, because normally Airsts use optically transparent, high-quality windows or lenses. While it is possible to have an infrared transparent but visibly opaque panel, I'm not sure what are the consequences in terms of long-range resolution and system flexibility as a whole. The Airst was one of the sensors asked during the Raptor development, but today an optically passive sensor is an important element of fifth-generation air combat. Consider that the F-35 has the DAS and the EOTS, and all the European, Russian and Chinese aircraft, all of them have an Erst. 
Please note that an Erst is not a flare. It is not a TV system with a telescope. I'll bet it can show images usually. It is more similar to a radar that scans the spherical volume around the aircraft and pinpoints the infrared sources in the sky. Then, when the source has been identified, it can zoom in and take a picture for identification. I really don't think that it would work well under an opaque panel. However, we know that an Earth is coming because it is in the Air Force requirements and we know from official declarations that there is no real estate left inside the aircraft to fit an Earth, particularly in the Raptor news. The Air Force and the Navy already have the Legion pod in service, but it doesn't look like the pods we have seen under the F-22. So, what I believe is in those pods is additional electronic warfare components or additional electronic support measures. It is likely that there is very little room left inside the F-22, whereby it was necessary to add an external payload. So much for upgradability. In this case, it seems that the pods and the pylons have inclined sides to provide a form of geometric stealth and remove the 90 degree angles. So they are probably metallic and the metallic content is dense enough not to be world protecting individually. So these little pods are in my view a bit of an enigma. Intuitively, they remind me of the electronic warfare pods used by the Russians and the Chinese, but with a stealthy form factor. And as usual, you can only wait and see. So, there you have it. The AIM-260 might require the F-22 to work, the NGAD won't be ready till the late 30s, the Air Force expects to fight China in the late 20s, and the Raptor is still the best option out there. No wonder they are trying to keep it current till the NGAD will be capable of picking up the role. And this is why the F-22 went from planned retirement to massive upgrades in the space of a few years. So thank you very much for getting this far into the video. I consider it a privilege and a honor to having had your time. An enormous thank you to all the patrons and channel members. You are essential for this operation and you will be even more essential for what the future has in store. If you can, only if you can, please consider supporting the channel in the way that is best suited for you. So, this is it. Thank you very much for watching and see you next time.